As competitive athletes, we are all familiar with stress, arousal, and anxiety, and the positive or negative effects it can have on our performance. My name is Amanda Leibovitz, and I am a certified mental performance consultant with years of experience working with a broad range of athletes, exercisers, and performers to teach them how to leverage their mental skills for success. And I'm really excited to be able to share with you some information about the stress response so we can understand a little bit better what is going on inside of our bodies, as well as teach you some very effective um, tools, skills, and strategies to manage your own levels of anxiety and arousal to stay in an optimal zone for performance success. So we are all familiar with stress and have experienced it in some way in our lives, but that doesn't mean we really understand what it is and how it affects our bodies. So I'm gonna take a couple of minutes to define and explain stress and the different types of stress that we encounter as we move throughout our day-to-day -day lives. First and foremost, we want to start thinking about stress as any situation in which our abilities or the perception of our abilities and the demands of the task or environment or our perception of that are imbalanced in some way and it's going to cause some sort of discomfort but in most cases that discomfort is an impetus for growth so if we're thinking about our sport training we oftentimes stress our bodies and put ourselves in uncomfortable situations because we know that it helps us grow and evolve as athletes we can also encounter stress in other areas of life, like academia, in the workplace, or even at home. And similarly, those same stressful situations cause us to grow and adapt as humans. However, not all of us are the same. This shouldn't be news to anyone. And we all have different tolerance levels for how much stress we are able to work with and still adapt in a positive way. And so some of us might only be able to handle a little bit of stress and still adapt positively. And others might be able to handle a whole lot of stress before we stop or before we lose the ability to adapt in a positive way. And so for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm gonna use this little jar, which represents kind of the collective tolerance for stress that any one of us might have um, within ourselves. And so with that, we also have two types of stress. We have the M&Ms, which are going to represent our good stress, which oftentimes is, you know, the stress we encounter in training that make us stronger, faster, smarter athletes. It could also be the stress of academia, of deadlines and finishing homework that causes us to grow as an intellectual or the stress we encounter at work that eventually results in us, you know, kind of elevating our career or advancing our career and developing certain skill sets that make us more valuable to the company. Um, and then we have our Skittles which would be our distress. And this might be interpersonal conflict. It could be illness. It could be injury. It could be COVID. It's really anything that's going on that is still going to cause us to change and adapt, but it might not be as enjoyable or as obviously beneficial as some of the other stressors we encounter. So, the thing is, is that if you have a bowl of M&Ms and a bowl of Skittles, you're kind of playing a risky game reaching in and just grabbing a handful. However, that's kind of how our body interprets stress. It really doesn't tell the difference between eustress, which is this good stress, and distress, which would be kind of characteristically bad stress. And so if we have a limited capacity to deal with stress, we might add some stress to the mix by having a really quality training session. But then let's say later in the day, we get into a fight with our partner or spouse over finances and we add some distress to the mix. But then the next day at work, we're asked to present to the board and it's stressing us out a little because it's a challenge, but it's ultimately a great opportunity for us to advance our career. 
And so far, we're continuing to adapt positively to all of this stress, regardless of the source. But then let's say that we have to, we forgot about our kids soccer practice and all of a sudden we're scrambling to do that. And that adds some to the top of the mix. And we're still, you know, doing okay, maybe a little bit spilled out. We're kind of at the edge of what we can tolerate. But then we have to go back to sport training, which we know is gonna put stress on our body and it's the M&M, so we know it's the really good stress. But none of this is allowing us to adapt in a positive way. And so being able to tune in to our overall level of stress and to intervene before our cup spills over is an incredibly beneficial skill as we're trying to develop as athletes who are performing at a high level, or even if we're recreational athletes that want to continue to enjoy our sport. The four stage stress response is a great way to conceptualize the feedback loop that is formed when we experience stress. First, we have an environmental demand which is followed by our perception or our interpretation of that demand. If we perceive this demand as a challenge or a threat, our stress response will kick in and we will experience physiological and psychological arousal, we'll experience some anxiety, muscle tension, and attentional changes too as a result. Our ability to effectively cope with this stress response will lead to a particular behavioral consequence, which will be reflected in our performance or even the outcome of competition. Whether the behavioral consequence is helpful or unhelpful to performance, the outcome will then influence how we perceive similar demands in the future, either increasing our confidence in our abilities to overcome challenges or increasing our perception that similar challenges are threatening. When the same feedback loop is repeated over and over again, it becomes a habit which might present as generalized pre-performance anxiety or, in a positive way, pre-performance confidence. Let's break down this stress response in a little more detail so we can really understand what is going on when we are faced with a challenge or threat. Just like on the last slide, we have environmental stressors, which can be external or internal. We then appraise all of this environmental information to determine how threatening the situation is. If we decide that the situation is threatening or challenging enough, our sympathetic nervous system kicks in and turns on our flight or fight response. Here's where things get really cool. Unless you are competing in a precision sport like archery or shooting, fight or flight can be quite helpful to performance. We get a little burst of adrenaline, our blood is diverted from our gut to our large muscle groups, and our heart and lungs start working harder to cycle really oxygen-rich blood to those muscles so we are ready to move. Similarly, our peripheral vision usually expands so we can see any threats that might be waiting in the wings, but this could be really helpful if you're playing a team sport and need to locate your teammates and opponents on the court. However, we can run into some trouble if we internalize these responses, which means our stress response becomes a chronic state of being even when no apparent threat is present rather than an acute reaction to a threat that's right in front of our faces. This can lead to maladaptive coping, which, if left unchecked, will likely lead to breakdown and burnout. So the question becomes, how can we keep this cycle adaptive? The answer to keeping our stress response adaptive, in check, and operating in a beneficial way is to adopt a mindful approach to engaging with our stress. If you haven't watched our earlier video on mindfulness training, mindfulness is the practice of paying attention on purpose to our thoughts, feelings, and body sensations as they happen in the present moment, and we do this without judgment. And mindfulness can help us in two big ways when we experience stress. First, 
we can maintain more control and awareness of our subjective appraisal of environmental stressors, whether they are coming from the situation itself or our internal thoughts, feelings, and sensations. Mindful awareness at this phase of the process helps to keep us from making a threat bigger than it actually is. That said, mindfulness isn't about preventing the stress response completely, since again, this can be adaptive and helpful for our survival and very often our performance. Therefore, when we are pulled into fight or flight, mindfulness allows us to stay in the driver's seat of our decision making and our experiences. Among other things, we will be able to identify and implement effective strategies to manage emotions. We will be more able to creatively solve problems and avoid black and white thinking. And we will also return to baseline and complete our stress response more quickly and completely. You may be wondering how we can actually complete this stress response. And one thing to keep in mind is that stress comes in two forms. First, we have the environmental stressor or situation. And second, we have our body's experience of stress. Simply removing the stressor does not mean that our body gets the message. So these strategies can be useful to communicate to our own bodies that there is no more threat and we can relax and return to baseline. Things like movement, emotional release, and creative outlets can signal to our body that we actually did something in response to the threat. Reaching out to family, friends, or any trusted person in your circle to either connect in a meaningful way or simply be around other people can help to remind you that you're not alone in facing your challenges, which can kick in our parasympathetic response. 20-second hugs with a COVID-appropriate partner um, will stimulate a release of the hormone oxytocin, which helps to calm our bodies and minds. And changing the tape is a cognitive um, tool or trick that involves recognizing a ruminating or repeating thought and replacing it with something neutral or helpful. Finally, we get to breathing, which is arguably the single most important and, and effective tool in our toolbox because it is always accessible to us. Tuning into our breathing will ground us back in the present moment and bring us back into our bodies, which can also have a very calming effect. Now that we are aware of the stress response and the ways that our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems work as the gas pedal and brake pedal for our overall sensations and feelings of arousal and anxiety across all kinds of situations, but particularly in sport competition, I wanna leave you with some strategies to actually regulate this level of arousal and anxiety for yourself so that you can stay in a zone that benefits you for optimal performance. As we talked about on the last slide, um, breath work and breathing is one of the most impactful ways that we can activate a parasympathetic nervous system response, which is the opposite of fight or flight, and allow us to bring down our level of arousal and anxiety so that we can continue to perform at our best. Breath work is incredible because it is always accessible to us. We're always breathing. Um, and it's also something we can do pretty discreetly, um, even if we're in public. And so there are two techniques that I want to teach you right now um, that are gonna be really easy and simple for you to begin to integrate into your own practice and as you move throughout your life. The first one is box breathing, which many military service members and veterans are familiar with but it involves inhaling for a count of four, holding for a count of four, exhaling for a count of four, and holding for a count of four. And you would move through this four count box breathing for six cycles, and that would actually be enough to get that parasympathetic nervous system going. Another approach, if box breathing isn't for you, or you wanna try something different, is called three-part breathing. 
And in this practice, we are imagining that our lungs are separated into three parts. We have our lower third, our middle third, and our upper third. And so we are going to exhale all of the air out of our lungs until it feels completely empty. And then breathe in to fill the lower third and pause. Breathe in to fill the middle third and pause. And breathe in to feel the upper third and sip air into the very tip top of our head, tuck our chin and hold for a brief moment. Then we untuck our chin and exhale a nice long and slow breath until our lungs are completely empty. And once they are empty, we start the cycle again. Um, just like before, we want to do this at least six times through to stimulate our vagal nerve and get that parasympathetic nervous system working for us to pump the brakes a little bit on our experience. And again, keep that arousal and anxiety at a manageable level. I hope you found this helpful and you incorporate these practices as you move forward in your training and competition. Until next time, have a wonderful day.